Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Is Israel preparing to target Iran's nuclear facilities? I ask that question because the Israel-Iran shadow war is taking a dangerous turn with each passing day. After allegedly bombing Iran's diplomatic mission in Syria, Israel, it seems, is planning something bigger. According to a report cited by the Times of Israel, the country has been conducting air force drills recently. And what are they in preparation of exactly? Well, the report says Israel is preparing to target Iran's nuclear facilities and other key infrastructure. You see, regional tensions escalated when suspected Israeli warplanes bombed Iran's consulate in Damascus last week, killing seven people, including Iran's top commander. Though Israel neither confirmed nor denied involvement, both Tehran and Damascus blamed Israel. In fact, Iran also swore revenge for the killing of its military generals. Since then, Israel has been in a state of high alert, bracing itself for any retaliatory strike from its arch nemesis. They say that if Iran attacks Israel directly, Israel will retaliate by striking targets. But by the looks of it, Israel is not taking any chances. Over the weekend, Israel relocated troops from Gaza's Khan units, in fact, cancelled leaves for its combat units, and mobilized more troops for air defense units. And if the latest report about Israel preparing to attack Iranian nuclear plants is accurate, then the world may be staring at a big escalation in West Asia, bigger than the ones previously imagined. It raises the specter of a wider war. Could Israel attack Iran's nuclear facilities? Experts say Israel could. Jeremiah 49, 34 through 37. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam. In the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go, for I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. In this prophecy, Jeremiah predicts that Iran will be struck at the foremost place of its might, which today could infer an attack upon its nuclear program. One of Iran's most strategic and vulnerable nuclear targets is Bashar nuclear reactor located in the heart of ancient Elam. Jeremiah says that Iran has fiercely angered the Lord, and that provokes the Lord to cause a severe disaster inside of Iran. Israel seeks to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear nation. Perhaps this alludes to a nuclear disaster caused from a strike upon Iran's Bushehr nuclear reactor. Let me tell you about what happened in the year 1981. In June of that year, the Israeli Air Force bombed an unfinished nuclear reactor in Iraq. It was Israel's most daring airstrike. 
In the 1970s, Iraq's dictator Saddam Hussein had started work on building a nuclear reactor. Israel, considering it as a big threat, bombed the under construction nuclear reactor. It was the longest range airstrike by Israel in a single day. Realistically speaking, what happens when you attack a nuclear facility? Radioactive leak that would result in death and destruction. Simply put, it would be catastrophic. The question is, will Israel go that far? Will the tensions between Israel and Iran take a nuclear turn? What do the numbers look like? Although there is no official data on this, multiple reports suggest that Israel's nuclear stockpile ranges between 80 to 400 nuclear warheads. These warheads reportedly can be delivered in multiple ways by aircraft, submarines, missiles, you name it. We are not saying Israel will use them, but in times of rising tensions, of course, it's worth factoring in the capabilities of the countries. So then in case there is a full-scale regional war with Iran, could things take a nuclear turn is the question. Six months later, the possibility of a direct Israel-Iran conflict is looking more and more plausible. Will the shadow war take a nuclear turn? That remains to be seen. Intense cross-border exchanges are ongoing along the Lebanese border with Hezbollah, mainly on the receiving side. This as the IDF completed a stage of preparations in case the conflict expands into full-blown war. IDF fighter jets carried out strikes on a military compound belonging to Hezbollah's elite Radwan force in Khaib in southern Lebanon. The compound includes seven buildings used by the terror group. The IDF also struck a Hezbollah command center in Tura. Elsewhere, an elite Hezbollah commander was killed along with two others in an Israeli strike on the village of al Sultania in southern Lebanon. Earlier, a barrage of rockets was fired from Lebanon at the Golan Heights and Manara area. The potential for hostilities to escalate into war continues. Another phase of the IDF Northern Command's readiness for war was completed, centering on operational emergency storages for a broad mobilization of reservists and regular troops, if and when required. This will enable the forces to arrive at the front line in a short period of time for defensive and offensive missions. Israel is ready for an invasion of Rafah despite U.S. opposition to the attack. Yesterday, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said it will happen. There is a date. The Biden administration has proposed another ceasefire in exchange for hostages, while Netanyahu continues to insist he won't settle for anything less than total victory. On Monday, Netanyahu announced Israel is not finished with Hamas in Gaza. We're working all the time to achieve our goals, primarily the release of our hostages and achieving a complete victory over Hamas. This victory requires entry into Rafah and the elimination of the terrorist battalions there. It will happen. There is a date. After months of on and off negotiations, the U.S. has reportedly proposed a new ceasefire deal. It would see a six-week halt in the fighting and exchange 40 hostages for 900 Palestinians imprisoned in Israel. Hamas is expected to respond to this latest proposal by Tuesday night. If they agree, the truce could begin as soon as Wednesday. The Biden administration has warned it could change its policy towards Israel if it goes forward with an invasion of Rafah. There are also signs it would like to see Netanyahu replaced as leader. Monday, the U.S. Secretary of State held high-level talks with the leader of Netanyahu's opposition, who might be more pliable to White House demands. As the IDF regroups and the U.S. calls for peace, some Israelis are taking to the streets, demanding the total defeat of Hamas. They say the world is putting pressure in the wrong place. Instead of telling the international community to place pressure on Hamas to release the hostages, they, they're placing pressure on Netanyahu and our government. We didn't start the war, they did, okay? They murdered 1,200 of our people. Is global chaos the new normal? As anyone can plainly see, the world is in a state of decay, moral, economic, political, every way possible. People are saying the world is out of control and looking for someone, anyone, to rescue the planet. Soon, very soon, a leader will appear on the horizon that appears to have all the answers to calm the oceans, to bring peace to all the nations. His title will be the Antichrist, 
and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. So yes, global chaos is the new normal until the Lord Jesus Christ comes at the end of the Antichrist's seven-year reign of terror and establishes true peace on earth. Daniel 9, 26 and 27 And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with the flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he, the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many, who is Israel, the Palestinians, and possibly other Muslim nations, for one week, which is seven years. But in the middle of the week, three and a half years, he, the Antichrist, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wings of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even unto the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. In Bible prophecy, we are told in Daniel 9, 26 and 27, the prince who is to come, who is the Antichrist, will come on the world scene and strongly confirm a seven-year covenant of peace in the Middle East between Israel and her enemies. This covenant will kick off the seven-year tribulation. We see the prophesied Antichrist right onto the world stage in Revelation 6-2. Immediately following the rider of the white horse beginning his conquest of the world, we see peace will be taken from the earth when the rider of the red horse of war begins his ride across the earth as we read in Revelation 6-3 and 4. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. Those who are here to see this will be as those who lived in the days of Noah. All will be well and life will be moving forward as normal when suddenly a flood of God's judgment will begin to fall on mankind which will last for seven years, the culmination of which will be the visible, physical, bodily return of Jesus Christ to the earth at Armageddon. So as we look at what prophecy predicts is going to occur, potentially in the not too distant future, the world is someday going to rejoice that peace has finally come to the Middle East. What will follow that, however, will be anything but peace as the world is suddenly going to explode into warfare. All those who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will not be here to see the terrible time to come wherein God's judgment will fall upon a world that has forgotten him. Where will we be? in the presence of Jesus Christ our Lord as a result of the rapture of the church. And there will be no announcement as to when that will take place whatsoever prior to it occurring. And if you find yourself here after it occurs, your future is going to be horrific. The stage is being set for Daniel's prophecy concerning the arrival of the Antichrist, which will be preceded by the rapture of the church. The only conclusion one can draw from all this is this. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Consider this a heads up if you're a Christian and be forewarned if you're a non-believer. If you're watching this and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's time to get to know Him, and the sooner the better. John 15, 18-20 If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. The arrest in an Idaho man on charges of plotting to carry out deadly attacks on churches in support of ISIS. The suspect was arrested on Saturday, just hours before the alleged planned assault on Sunday. Authorities say he had picked a specific church where he would start his attack, set for the end of Ramadan. John 16, 1 through 3. These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Service is the Greek word latria, which means ministration of God, i.e. worship. Muslims kill in the name of Allah, thinking they offer God worship. The Bible tells us they do it because they do not know the Father nor His Son, Jesus Christ. This morning, the FBI claims this 18-year-old was on the verge of conducting a terror plot involving attacks on multiple churches in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Alexander Mercurio seen here knife in hand and expressing his allegiance to ISIS. The FBI says his plot involved a murderous rampage using knives and firearms to kill parishioners. He also planned to set their houses of worship on fire going from church to church until he was killed by police. 
It's a plan eerily similar to that recent ISIS assault on that concert hall in Moscow. They talked about using knives, fire, and possibly weapons. And so the combination of all three, if in fact he did launch that, had the, the, the possibility of harming a lot of people. According to criminal charges unsealed last night, Mercurio had bought a number of items for his attack, including butane canisters for setting fires. And those charges say on Saturday, Mercurio sent an audio file to an FBI confidential informant. 20 seconds long, it says in part, I'm answering the call for the Islamic State for jihad and to kill. The charges against Mercurio lay out a chilling plan where he would, quote, incapacitate his father, restrain him using handcuffs, and steal his firearms to use for maximum casualties in his attack. Sources tell ABC News his father had dozens of weapons, including an AR-15 style assault rifle. Mercurio's arrest comes in a state of heightened alert by U.S. law enforcement. Authorities have been concerned about rage ignited by the Israeli Hamas war, and late last week they sent out an urgent bulletin warning that ISIS was trying to use their horrific attack on that Moscow concert to inspire radicals here to conduct U.S. attacks. In announcing this arrest last night, we received statements from both the attorney general and the FBI director, both expressing deep concern. Their statements are a sign of just how serious this case is and just how dangerous the threat environment is right now. The Christian persecution the church is suffering right now, awful as it is, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, the greatest political leader in the history of mankind will take the world stage. He will launch a military campaign that will result in his acquiring authority over all peoples of the earth as we read in Revelation 13, 7 and 8. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. His empire will be the most extensive in all of history, encompassing the entire world, and his rule will be the most demonic the world has ever experienced. He will appear to be the savior of the world, but as he consolidates his power, his true nature will be revealed. He will emerge as a Satan-possessed and empowered person who hates God and is determined to annihilate Christianity. His method of eliminating Christians will be by beheading as we read in Revelation 24. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. For this reason, he is identified in scripture as the Antichrist as we read in 1 John 2.18. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. 1 Corinthians 16.13 Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Flood sirens blared in Russian cities on Tuesday as over 100,000 people in both Russia and Kazakhstan were ordered to evacuate. In some of the worst flooding in 70 years, swiftly melting snow across the Ural Mountains, Siberia and areas of Kazakhstan has swelled major rivers, some rising by metres in hours to the highest levels ever recorded. The Ural River, Europe's third largest, burst through an embankment dam on Friday, flooding the city of Orsk, just south of the Ural Mountains. Yes, problem. Downstream, water levels in Orenburg, a city of around half a million, were rising with peak levels expected on Wednesday. As the Tobol River rises, people in the city of Kurgan have been warned to evacuate immediately, and Governor Vadim Shumkov urged residents to take the warning seriously. The wider region is home to around 800,000, with water levels in some parts of the Tobol rising 29 inches in just two hours. More than 19,000 people are at risk in Kurgan, the TASS news agency reported. Emergencies were declared in Orenburg, Kurgan and Tumen, a major oil-producing region of western Siberia. President Vladimir Putin has been monitoring the floods from Moscow, but anger boiled over in Orsk when at least 100 Russians begged the Kremlin chief to help and chanted shame on you at local officials who they said had done too little. The head of the Russian Ministry of Emergency Situations, Alexander Kurenkov, 
flew to Orenburg region on Tuesday to monitor the situation after being tasked to do so by Putin, the ministry said. The ministry added preventative measures are being taken and rescue teams have been strengthened. It was not immediately clear why the annual snow melt had made this year's floods so bad. Scientists say climate change has made flooding more frequent worldwide. We have reached the stage where there is literally no pause between major weather disasters hitting the world. It is just one disaster after another. When times were normal, there would be a major disaster every once in a while. But now we have reached the stage where there's literally no pause between them. Sadly, this is how it's going to be now. It's just going to be one disaster after another. And most people will have absolutely no idea why any of this is happening. We are living in very troubled times and people need hope. We read about that hope in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you have not already done so, I strongly urge you to call upon the name of Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior today. This is what was left after Storm Pyrrhic battered West Sussex and the River Arran burst its banks. The seaside town of Little Hampton is often at risk of flooding, but nothing like this. The rescue operation began around midnight. One person showing signs of hypothermia was taken to hospital as fire and rescue teams moved in to move residents on. More than 200 people were evacuated, most of them forced to flee from Medbury Holiday Park. Among them, Paul Maskell. He spent three hours stranded on his decking, drifting further and further away from his holiday chalet. She was on the bed, um, nearly on the bed, and I see the bed lift and the bed started floating. So then I know it was time to get out. And the sofa was floating and everything was floating, everything was just floating around. 13 miles up the road, others assess what's left of their home. Peter's lived here for 12 years. He stayed at his son's house when the floods hit. We went with him as he returned to take a look at the damage. They suggested we went upstairs, but I thought that was a bit of a non-entity. Heavy rain, strong winds and high tides plunged Little Hampton underwater. Residents were told to move to higher ground, but at this bungalow estate, that wasn't possible. Many people here say they simply weren't alerted as to how severe the flooding would be. We were given warning, but it, it was, to me it wasn't emphasised enough that it was going to be of this magnitude. All of a sudden, there was like a deluge. The deluge came over and it was like this, and it just came through our, our doors, and it was a frightening experience to see this kind of height in your, in your front living room. It means businesses like this one in this shipyard are now in limbo. It probably had at least this much inside the workshop. So. Really? Still without power and unable to get back to work. I haven't even started to add the cost up, you know. We're not insured here for flooding because it is in, it is in a risk area. So we're talking hundreds of pounds, thousands? Thousands, thousands. You know, I don't even know yet because of the... until we get some power on, which nobody seems to know when that's coming. The stormy weather didn't discriminate. Strong winds pummeled the Devonshire coast too, while parts of the Wirral were buffeted by flood water as fast winds met high tides. The flooding comes after record rainfall seen in England in the past 18 months. Those evacuated remain displaced and forecasters warn that even more heavy rain and strong winds are on the way. A monster rain event has forced people to flee their homes and left parts of the east coast underwater. In Sydney, emergency crews have carried out hundreds of rescues, while Queensland is tonight on high alert. Treacherous waters unleash. This toddler washed from a break wall. Her father scrambles, but too late. Both are okay, stable 
in hospital. Emergency services called to nearly 3,000 incidents in New South Wales, making more than 150 rescues. In this inland ocean, a lifeboat is the lifeline, manned by a heroic rescue crew delivering Marcus Leon to safety. He'd been trying to save his farm animals. Almost 4,000 volunteers toiled through the night and into today to keep locals safe. Those who didn't evacuate, evaluated. Homes and businesses damaged by the floodwaters. It's been an incredibly long night. I've never seen Stone Quarry come up as quickly as it did last night. In an hour it come up, surged. Council didn't have time to do too much either. The thing was it was coming up from the drains. So there was really no way, you know, of yeah. escaping it. Rivers running where there should be roads, front yards resembling marinas, boats on trailers as much use as the family car. The state was bombarded by rain, torrential doesn't quite cut it. In one area, there was 257 millimetres in 24 hours. Near the Warragamba Dam, there was 130 mils in just six hours. Bursting at the brim, early this morning, it spilled. Communities along catchment areas still in danger of going under. Flash flooding and isolated landslips or localised landslips are still a risk as uh, rain is still falling in the south coast. It could still come down in southeast Queensland as well. The floodgates holding it back for now. This community is split in two. Another has been flooded with trucks that are cut off. So it's kind of tripled our population very quickly. The danger easing but not over. From drought in Zimbabwe to record wildfires in Venezuela, every month since June 2023 has beaten its own hottest ever tag and March 2024 was no exception. The European Union's Copernicus Climate Agency says the long-term trend of exceptional records has them very concerned. Seeing records like this uh, month in, month out, really shows us that our climate is changing, is changing rapidly, and climate change isn't a future problem. It is a problem that we have to face here and now. Psalm 107, 33 and 34. He turns rivers into a wilderness, and the water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness, for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. Colombia's reservoirs are running dry. A prolonged El Nino weather phenomenon and an ongoing drought has dropped their levels to their lowest in four decades. Bogotá's mayor has announced an unprecedented citywide water rationing starting on Thursday, explaining that repeated calls to save water since January have not been enough. Our goal is to change the habits of citizens of Bogotá to guarantee the supply of potable water in the short and medium term. These measures are necessary and inevitable to guarantee the next month's and also next year's supply. Bogotá, a city of 9 million people, will be divided into nine sectors, with each area going 24 hours without water every 10 days. The objective is to reduce household consumption by 11 percent to mitigate the strain. Authorities will re-evaluate the measure every two weeks. It is very worrying because this had not happened in many years. The truth is I never lived through anything like this. It is time we became more aware about water and how we manage it. The drought exacerbated by El Nino saw Colombia start the year with scorching temperatures and hundreds of forest fires, including on mountains overlooking Bogotá. We're walking inside the San Rafael Reservoir, one of the two main reservoirs that supply more than 70% of the drinkable water to the city of Bogota. It has been almost completely depleted here. You can see these measuring posts, uh, these ruler posts uh, that show that the level here is down to zero. Overall, the reservoir is down to less than 18% of its total capacity. Colombia also uses reservoirs to generate 95% of all its electricity. Authorities say that the reservoir's national average is now at 31%, just four points above a 27% threshold that would trigger a national power grid alert. And with it, the possibility of widespread power outages. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past, 
and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16, 21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16, 8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Fox News alert, an Icelandic volcano erupting after a crater cracked and unleashed a massive flow of lava. Shortly after the initial eruption, the volcanic crater collapsed in on itself and has caused even more lava to start flowing. Right now, it doesn't pose any immediate danger, but has the potential to reach a major road if the situation worsens. the ongoing aftershocks from Friday's rare East Coast earthquake. Believe it or not, there have been more than two dozen of them. So many people here in the Northeast were already unsettled when the earthquake hit because, as you said, this is not common here. And then came the aftershocks. There was at least one as recently as Saturday morning, and that was just one of more than 30 since that quake on Friday. But look, these are not uncommon. Experts say they can happen for weeks, even months or years following an earthquake. That 4.8 magnitude quake striking near White House Station, New Jersey in the morning Friday for about 30 seconds near the epicenter. And it was felt as far south as Washington, D.C. and up to Maine. Experts estimating about 42 million people might have felt it. There has been a dramatic increase in volcanic eruptions around the world, and nobody knows why. You probably haven't noticed because nobody seems to be talking about it, but something is going on with the world. Volcanoes are erupting at a faster pace than ever, and earthquakes are going crazy, and nobody has an explanation for it. Nobody except God, that is. The seven-year tribulation is fast approaching this world, and the news headlines prove it. God in his grace and mercy is trying to shake the world out of its complacency. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. Jesus is likening last day's events to a woman in labor. The closer we get to Jesus' second coming, last day signs and calamities will become more frequent and more intense. Following the rapture of all true Christians to heaven, the Bible warns us that the wrath of God will be poured out on an unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation seems to include a massive volcanic eruption, as we read in Revelation 8.8. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. Luke 21, 26-28 Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. 
All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.